So I'm an academic lawyer, I teach at a university, so I'm predominantly interested in legal activism and in the challenges to prohibition that we can bring through the courts, but also in how cognitive liberty can infuse drug policy activism more generally. I've been involved over the years in helping a number of people who are being prosecuted um, and had a number of cases um, thrown out of court through, through our work on their defences. On the whole, when people are prosecuted for psychedelic use, um, they don't generally generally challenge the, prohibit the prohibitive framework. But when they do, on the rare occasions when they do, they tend to do so through a rights-based framework. So namely, arguing that their human rights have been infringed by psychedelic drug prohibition and that the, the former, their rights should take precedence over the latter, over prohibition. Um, and such rights-based defensives have historically been either um, pleas for therapeutic um, exemptions or for religious exemptions from prohibition. And, and I think that's either because those categorizations you know, accurately reflect the reason why those people were taking psychedelics, but also because there's believed to be a protective power within the religious and therapeutic exemptions. We need to go beyond therapeutic and religious exemptions in our rights-based challenges to psychedelic drug prohibition for a number of different reasons. So first of all, I think the fact that these are artificial distinctions that can easily melt into one another. So if, for instance, if we adopt a holistic understanding of health so that it incorporates the notions of humans flourishing to our full potential as against the simple absence of physical or mental illness. There's no bright line between using substances therapeutically, using them for spiritual reasons, or indeed using them for pleasure. Um, and similarly, a more expansive view of religion will acknowledge alternative ideologies to those belief systems that are steeped to, to greater or lesser degrees in dogma. So this idea that religion, in, in its broadest sense, really just describes our understanding of the world and of our part on it, our part in it rather, and that psychedelics may or may not play a part in that understanding. But that accordingly, I think that exemption from prohibition should also apply to those of us who have more loosely spiritual experiences on psychedelics, unbounded by any established religious framework. And I think this situation is intensified by the fact that an offshoot of ingesting these mo molecules is often a questioning of orthodoxies. And taking this argument further, you know, taking psychedelics may catalyze a spiritual experience. It may lead to you having a direct encounter with unified transcendence. But then again, it may not. Um, and as you're all aware, the fact that these substances are perhaps best understood as non-specific amplifiers, so their effects are largely determined by who's taking them, with what mindset, and in which environment. To my mind, there, there is no clear division between the sacred and the profane, and adding psychedelics into the mix can fudge the issue yet further. Um, I think it sort of exposes the inadequacy of those kinds of binary distinctions. And that often our experiences with psychedelics implicitly encourage us to expand our idea of the sacred. Furthermore, even were there such a thing as a categorically non-spiritual experience on psychedelics, does it then follow that that experience shouldn't be eligible for human rights protection, that it should be criminally prohibited? It might still be of equal significance to the individual concerned, or it might even be relatively insignificant to the individual concerned, and should this matter? So really, whether or not it's believed that individuals should have to justify their psychedelic use on any grounds is bound up with one's view of the proper relationship between the individual and the state, and with whether or not you believe that the state has any business concerning itself with which substances you choose to ingest. So therapeutic and religious exemptions are considerably better than nothing, um, and one of the things I'm involved with is trying to get these exemptions. Um, but they do perpetuate the notion that we should only be able to take psychedelics in constrained circumstances that the government has deemed acceptable. And it's my firmly held belief that society should work towards maximizing everybody's autonomy. And so thinking about how we might best do this, um, and, and I think one possibility is through a human rights-based framework. Throughout Europe, um, we're a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights, which, as its name suggests, enshrines human rights protections. And Article 9 of this convention, alongside protecting freedom of religion, also protects freedom of thought.
Um, and so I think that's, that's a way forward. And, and I hope you'll forgive me for sort of briefly discussing this European provision in the United States, but I th hopefully my arguments translate because freedom of thought is obviously pivotal to the rights protected by the US Constitution. One of my central claims is that the jurisprudence on freedom of thought needs to evolve so that it's interpreted to incorporate cognitive liberty. Um, and thinking a little more about what's meant by this term, cognitive liberty. So in one sense, cognitive liberty is, is synonymous with freedom of thought. But more precisely, it evokes the idea that this should be read to acknowledge the fact that we should have the right to autonomous self-determination over our own brain chemistry, a right that's currently infringed by psychedelic drug prohibition. And the importance of cognitive liberty is encapsulated here by one of the great writers on this, Richard Glenn Bois, who says that the right to control one's own consciousness is the quintessence of freedom. So given the fact that our thought processes are of a chemical nature, controlling the chemicals that we can ingest, prohibiting psychedelics, can be seen as an interference with cognitive liberty, because these substances are necessary precursors to particular styles of thinking. So prohibition can be viewed as a form of censorship, a series of psychopharmacological filters that curtail the mental landscapes that are available to us. And Tom Roberts is one of the great and early champions of this notion, and he clarifies here that freedom of thought includes freedom of both the contents of thinking and the processes of thinking. By needlessly restricting the accessibility of drug-produced states, current laws limit what we can know about our minds and how we can use them. In some senses, you can think about this as, as a radical approach, to argue for a right to use psychedelics as a component of cognitive liberty is obviously to do a lot more than to ask for limited therapeutic or religious exemptions to the drug laws. Indeed, it threatens the very structure of prohibition. But from another perspective, what could be less radical than demanding the right to be in control of our own consciousnesses? And I think that any society that forbids this is not a truly free society. Indeed, cognitive liberty can be seen as a natural extension of classic liberalism, as perhaps most famously espoused by the legal theorist John Stuart Mill, who I'm sure you're all aware was primarily concerned with the nature and limits of the power that can legitimately be exercised by the state over the individual. Mill laid down the prevention of harm to others as the essential prerequisite to justifiable criminalization from a liberal perspective paternalism is ruled out. You know, the idea that we should be allowed to legislate to protect psychedelic users from themselves. For one thing, it's, it's implicitly infantilizing and therefore deeply problematic. It should remain up to us as individuals, um, not the state sort of spuriously on our behalf to prioritize whether or not we accord greater value to the possibility of a mystical experience versus an outside risk of either physical or psychological harm. And I think furthermore, even on paternalistic grounds, our drug laws fail, because how can being subjected to state punishment possibly be for our own good when the primary and often solitary harm being suffered is that inflicted from on high rather than from having been high? And liberalism also rules out legal moralism. Um, so the unsupported ideology that psychedelic users should be subject to prohibitive measures as these substances are intrinsically bad. Liberty comprises the freedom to choose, including the freedom to make um, what the moral majority might consider to be poor choices. And how could it be otherwise? You know, who but ourselves should decide what's of value to us? It's through such choices, including through deciding which substances to ingest or not, that we engage in a process of self-creation. And when the law limits such choices, it curtails who we can become. And Mill famously advocated experiments in living as a key driver of human process. And so I think that accordingly, we should be free to carry out chemical experiments in the living laboratories of our own bodies. And I think just taking a moment to, to think more deeply about why this issue is so important and why it's ultimately about so much more than simply the right to get high that it's so easily derisively dismissed as. So protecting our right to cognitive liberty is about protecting our right to self-realization and to realization of the lives that we want to lead.
Um, just as an aside, one of the major challenges, I think, of activism in this area is that those people who've had profound experiences on psychedelics generally don't need convincing of their value, um, whereas those who haven't tend to find the suggestion that freedom of thought should encompass the right to cognitive liberty and thus include the right to take psychedelics as somewhat laughable. So you can end up either, a pre uh, either sort of preaching to an enthusiastic choir or conversely to a sort of wholly unreceptive audience. But I think that it's really important that we keep talking and that we replace negative narratives with tales of these substances is transformative potential, um, along with developing the science in an attempt to influence policy. And I think that's why conferences like this one and the work that, that we were hearing described yesterday and we'll hear more about today um, is, so, um, is so crucial. So I advocate a negative liberty, the freedom to be left alone to do as one pleases. Um, but what of the fact that, that, as the psychedelics themselves often render vividly apparent, human beings are all intimately interconnected? And does this fact not create societal obligations, meaning that judgment calls relating to whether or not we may or we may not freely ingest a psychedelic as an aspect of freedom of thought can't be taken at an atomized, individualized level? Most liberals would accept that it does, but in line with the harm principle, incursions into freedoms will only be valid um, where exercising them would create real, measurable harms in society. You know, practically all of our actions potentially affect others. And the question is whether exercising one's cognitive liberty by taking psychedel psychedelics sets back others' interests sufficiently to warrant interference with this right. It's out of recognition that some actions can impact upon others to an extent that justifiably warrant state interference with rights that there are qualifiers to many of the articles in the European Convention, and indeed to most human rights instruments, just in relation to the European one, the, the right, and then the qualifiers here. And on the face of it, these qualifiers seem to arise out of legitimate concerns about tangible harm to others. So that renders them largely unproblematic from a liberal perspective. But what's more contentious is the ease with which the qualifiers tend to be engaged in practice in cases in the courts involving psychedelics, where supposed harms are not empirically demonstrated in the courtroom. Any posited harms should be proven rather than assumed. And importantly, even where harm is evidenced, we need to remember that it's one thing to show harm, and it's quite another thing entirely to demonstrate that the best way of minimizing such harm is through criminalization, which most often serves to lay a harm upon harm. Lots of activities are potentially harmful to others. It doesn't necessarily follow that we need to deal with them through the criminal law. And what the courts tend to do is to weave unsupported, futuristic, worst-case scenarios as regards what's likely to happen out of an individual's drug-taking, and then use this to justify engaging the qualifiers. And this fatally undermines the human rights protections that, that we ostensibly have. So in practice, what happens is that the courts avoid protecting certain people's freedoms when to do so would be unpopular, either politically or with the public. So behind the guise of legal objectivity, value judgments are made with the moral imperative protect to protect rights undermined by legal moralism. And in fact, you can see um, that protection of pu public morals is one of the recognized qualifiers to Article 9. And this in itself is deeply troublesome from a liberal perspective. So liberal moralism is this sort of notion of, of almost like a free-floating evil um, unrelated to any measurable harm. And it's entirely unacceptable, even in moral basis, for, for um, infringing upon people's rights. And of course, an immoral justification for prohibition itself. Immoral because the power to infringe rights, not to mention to impose punishment, should be taken seriously by the state. Even supposedly objective assessments of harm can never be entirely free of human judgments. You know, as a human endeavor, they're always going to inevitably involve subjective decisions, such as, for instance, how much weight to accord any given parameter. But we should at least attempt to ground our drug policy in evidence-based, scientifically measurable reality. 
considering the evidence that tends to be ignored in practice. And this was produced by a group of UK scientists led by David Nutt, and they synthesised the available relevant literature on different drugs and then created a hierarchy of harms. And what the hierarchy reveals is that UK drug classification system, and by extrapolation, most countries' drug classification systems are composed of pseudo-scientific divisions that are not borne out by empirical evidence, with an almost perversely inverse correlation between risk of harm and positioning. The clear front-runner in terms of both personal harm and social harm is alcohol, a substance that's um, legally sanctioned throughout most of the globe. And psychedelics, conversely, are at the opposite end of nut scale, posing very low risk of social harm consequent to their use. Yet the vast majority of them are criminalised as Class A drugs in the UK and indeed in Schedule 1 in the US. So the fact that drinkers of alcohol can alter their consciousness freely, their right to cognitive liberty undisturbed by state sanction, despite the risk they statistically pose to others, while psychedelic users are persecutors, is legally questionable and evidences arbitrary discrimination in the protection or otherwise of our rights. Um, just as an aside, a, a sort of criticism of Nutt's matrix is that it repeats the error of classification systems in general in that it focuses unduly, I think, on discrete substances as against the ways, either harmful or beneficially transformative, in which they're taken. Um, and I think that the future of drug policy needs to see us developing a much more nuanced approach structured around trying to improve the ways in which drugs are taken rather than you know, criminalising specific substances. Substances. It's also important when um, assessing the risk of harms posed by psychedelics not to include the harms caused by prohibition itself, lest one's argument become circular, which is an easy trap to fall into and which um, you'll often hear um, people falling into. Furthermore, undertaking a, um, a proper balancing exercise should involve weighing any potential harms against the benefits of psychedelics. So the fact that these substances might advantage their users remains largely absent from the language of the courts and from policy discussion. And the very idea that we should be allowed to take psychedelics because we enjoy them is rarely invoked, as though pleasure were a dirty word and there has to be some kind of higher motivation to get high. And I think we need to challenge this view or else become implicitly complicit in the puritanism of accepted discourse. And given the benefits that so many claim from psychedelics, up to and including achieving enlightenment, or at least catching transient glimpses of, of it, um, it shouldn't be necessary for users to prove that these substances are risk-free, because like most things, they're not, but rather for the state to prove that the harms to society actually do outweigh the benefits. And crucially, the courts need to recognize that benefits to the individual may may translate into benefits for society as a whole, which is, of course, comprised of individuals, and the more free they are, the better, presumably. Appreciation of the fact that the deep benefits users might accrue from their psychedelic use often benefit society punctures this dichotomous assumption that in deciding whether or not to allow the use of these substances, a choice needs to be made between the freedom of individuals to use psychedelics, which may, at a push, be recognised as benefiting them, but seen as being at the expense of potential harm to society and thus unjustifiable, to recognising that psychedelics may benefit both the individual concerned and society. And for many, this is a transcendental sort of leap to make, especially given how stigmatised certain psychedelics and their users are. So it's crucially important that we help people to make this leap. Acknowledgement of this would tip the scales from this to this. To develop this point, I think it, it's worth noting here that, that, as you're well aware, numerous underground movements centred around psychedelics have benefited wider society enormously. We need idealists, people who can think outside of societal constraints to move us forward and to prevent things from stagnating. And I think this perhaps becomes most visible when these underground movements start bubbling to the surface, such as, for instance, with the legitimization of the benefits of cannabis in a therapeutic context in this country, or rather the re-legitimizing, because as you know, this is an ancient healing plant. Or as a second example, the emerging re-legitimization of the use of psychedelics in psychotherapy. They're showing great promise in treating a range of mental health conditions, from PTSD to depression to addiction to end-of-life anxiety and so on. 
This is one of my central contentions, that as psychedelic drug policy activists, we should reorient ourselves, focusing on enhancing rights and emphasizing benefits, rather than, for instance, the more traditional drug policy activist prioritization of harm reduction. Whilst the harm reduction approach has been incredibly useful and has undoubtedly saved countless lives, I think it's perhaps best understood as a stepping stone, particularly when we hone in on the psychedelics, as I believe we must. Harm reduction is ultimately limiting in that it falls into the trap of buying into certain aspects of the prohibitionist's line. So, for example, an assumption of harm reduction, be it implicit or explicit, is that one of the best ways to reduce harm is to reduce use. But perhaps there are some of us in this room who think that the world might be a better place if a few more of us were psychedelicized. This is the line taken by an activist organisation that was recently established in the UK, the Psychedelic Society, whose mission is to unleash psychedelic pride, complete with organising psychedelic coming out events. And of course, coming out as a psychedelic user isn't an easy thing to do, given how high the stakes can be when admitting to any criminalised activity, such as loss of employment, loss of freedom to travel to certain countries, most notably the US, and so on. As an analogy, it wasn't easy for those who came out when homosexuality was criminalised either. And over a relatively short space of time, homosexuality has happily morphed from being criminalised to same-sex couples' ability to marry being increasingly recognised as a human right. So things can change, things do change, and as evidenced by the, by the gay rights movement, the most impressive changes come about through deploying a rights-based stance. But things certainly don't don't change inevitably through the powers that be suddenly seeing the error of their ways. It takes bravery, it takes activism, and again I believe this activism should be rights-based rather than grounded in harm reduction. I think if we rely on harm reduction based arguments to try and collapse the prohibitionist regime, we run the risk that even if we're successful, psychedelic users could be left with such a strictly controlled regulatory model to protect against such harms that it becomes almost a watered down, attenuated version of prohibition itself. So, just thinking about what's the solution, and I can't, I can't configure exactly what it would look like, and I'd be really interested to hear people's thoughts on this, but I believe that adopting a rights-based stance more naturally leads us down a more creative path into developing a new paradigm rooted in self-regulation, whereby we can access the substances of our choosing in the ways that we require, as is our right. And thinking about how realistic this is in, in, the, in the current political climate, and unfortunately, um, the outlook at the moment, at least in my country in the UK, is rather bleak. There are some more promising developments here in the US. We have a recently elected conservative government, um, and they have signaled their intention to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights. And as one of their first acts upon taking power earlier this year, they produced something called the Psychoactive Substances Bill, which is a piece of legislation that will render it unlawful to trade in any substance capable of producing a psychoactive effect, because heaven forbid that any of us should experience anything other than quotidian consciousness. Incidentally, the Psychedelic Society, who I mentioned earlier, organised a really entertaining protest against this legislation this past summer, where crowds of people gathered outside the Houses of Parliament and all inhaled nitrous oxide balloons <laughs> at the same time whilst it was still legal, with this commendably rights-based slogan of my mind, my choice. If anything, the attempt to pass legislation such as this serves to emphasise yet further the importance of approaching psychedelic drug policy activism from the perspective of human rights, ensuring a healthy relationship between the state and the individual. When we lose that, the state believes that it has the right to tell us that we can't ingest anything that has a psychoactive effect unless it explicitly tells us that we can, which it is only doing if what we want to ingest is, ironically, the potentially extremely harmful but culturally sanctioned psychoactive substance alcohol and tobacco, which are of course exempted from the legislation. So the Psychoactive Substances Bill is yet another example of the extreme damage that can be caused by positing mythical worst case scenarios without recourse to actual assessments of harm to evidence. And via this paranoid focus on harms, such draconian legislation is viewed as acceptable to protect us. When evaluated through the prism of rights, it's exposed as an intolerable intrusion into our private choices. And of course, this legislation won't achieve its aims and it will create numerous detrimental side effects as such prohibitive enactments always do. 
people will continue to buy psychoactive substances, both classic and novel. Indeed, to end on a more upbeat note, one of the most interesting developments in the past few years has been the use of the dark web to sell drugs, including a cornucopia of psychedelics. And this phenomenon was, I believe, inevitable. You can't bring up generations in the grip of rampant capitalism, train them as greedy little consumers who can have anything that they desire if they can only pay for it, and then tell them that actually drugs are banned, you can't eat the forbidden fruit, you can't you know, eat from the tree of knowledge, and expect them to take you seriously. So ironically, the idea that we should be able to consume what we can afford and beyond has almost been elevated to a right in its own right. And new technologies were always going to be manipulated so as to facilitate this. Um, and I'm sure that earlier this year, many of you were following the trial of Ross Ulbricht, um, also known as Dread Pirate Roberts, the former chief administrator of perhaps the most famous online drug retail website, The Silk Road. And Ulbricht very much sees himself as a libertarian, as a freedom fighter, as you can see from this extract from The Silk Road Charter. In tandem with such justifications, harm reduction arguments were also raised in court, with Ulbricht's defense contending that The Silk Road, with its Amazon style, style rating systems, its customer feedback, had actually led to higher quality products being sold alongside the removal of attendant risks for customers who buy online rather than from street dealers. And these arguments, whilst borne out by the evidence, were roundly rejected, with Ulbricht being awarded two life sentences without the possibility of parole. Despite Albrecht paying the price through the loss of his freedom, websites akin to the Silk Road continue to proliferate on the dark web. Like the mythical Hydra, every time a head is cut off, another one grows. There's always a new online marketplace ready to replace those that are shut down. And from a radical rights-based perspective, this can perhaps be viewed as a good thing, with the existence of such sites enabling more and more people to exercise their cognitive liberty beyond the reaches of liberally unjustifiable laws. And this idea is neatly encapsulated by the journalist Mike Power, who's commented that in just under two years, the Silk Road administrators have used technology and ingenuity to achieve what thousands of campaigners have toiled since the 1960s to achieve, the right for people to buy and sell natural and artificial chemicals that affect their consciousness in ways they choose without interference from the state. The creation of online drug markets can thus be viewed as yet another example of unconstrained underground movements helping society to progress. And these developments can, I think, also be seen, perhaps, as the death knell of prohibition, with te new technologies so beautifully and anarchically impossible to govern as psychedelic drug use itself, and with both of them throwing up similar questions about the acceptable reach of state control and restrictions on our cognitive liberty. In my activism work, one of the main things that I am involved in is trying to get religious exemptions. So I sort of glossed over them in this talk because I was looking at the broader picture and my ideal is that we should move towards cognitive liberty for all. But also, as you say, we live in you know, conservative um, countries in, in many ways. Um, and so I think pragmatically, sometimes sort of starting with religious freedom is a, it's a good um, it's, a, it's a good place to start. Um, I think there's probably a lot more chance of gaining... I mean, you already have religious exemptions in a number of cases in this country. We don't have any in the UK. Our attempts at religious exemptions have been unsuccessful. Um, but... I do think, and it's not for a second that I'm saying that I don't think protecting people's right to direct spiritual experience is important. I think it's crucial. I just think we need to go beyond it. Um, I'm involved with, um, with setting up an organization at the moment in, in the United Kingdom um, called the Teacher Plant Legal Defense Fund, um, which we, we have a sort of quite a basic website if anyone wants to look on that. Um, and one of the things that we're going to be working towards is trying to gain religious exemptions. So we're going to have a, a, a sort of reactive strategy. So when people are arrested for carrying out ayahuasca ceremonies, for instance, that we have a, a team of top legal defense experts in the psychedelic area who will help construct a sort of high level defense um, and hopefully kind of set good precedents in, I mean, it exists around the world, but I, I'm involved in the English one. Um, and then also we're going to develop a, a proactive strategy um, where we'll be applying for licenses for people to hold ceremonies. So it will be um, sort of 
using the religious freedom exemption, but beyond strict religions and um, for sort of more spiritual exemptions, which you can do under the European Convention, because it doesn't when it when it protects religious freedom, that's construed extremely broadly, and it it, it potentially protects all kinds of spirituality. So we're going to be having a kind of proactive strategy, trying to gain exemptions through um, a license system for people who are carrying out ceremonies. We're also going to be sort of lobbying at UN level, etc. So we've got this sort of reactive and proactive. So I am really interested in that area, and I think it's crucially important. Important. You know, realistically, cognitive liberty probably isn't going to play well in the courts. And if you're arrested as part of a ceremony, going down the religious freedom route would be a lot wiser than, um, than claiming cognitive liberty. Somebody was saying to me the other day that when we're looking at cognitive liberty, we should look at models where the, the liberty arguments have been successful. So we should look at the model, for instance, that the NRA uses and see what we can kind of learn from that. I think the distinction is um, harm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I guess that's where we'd maybe sort of divert. Um, but but um, so, so yes, I think that because... Because you do obviously end up potentially on dangerous ground. If you're saying I should be able to do this because I want to and it's my freedom, you can potentially get yourself onto dangerous ground. But I think if you, you firmly anchor yourself around, how, you know, does this potentially cause harm to others and does that outweigh the benefits to myself, then, then you'll, you know, you'll keep yourself, you'll keep yourself on, uh, sort of afloat. We had this spate of enacting laws in the UK that deal with really minor sort of antisocial behaviour and almost just impoliteness, really. A lot of the arguments from civil libertarians against those laws was that we need a space where it's just left to people to sort of decide their own morality, to sort of help construct our morality. We can't legislate. You know, we don't, we don't in our countries legislate against adultery, for example, though, though many of us may think that it's immoral. Or, you know, so you have to leave a space for people's own private morality, I think, and, and the, the state should, should be um, really sort of parsimonious in terms of where it legislates. And I think, you know, in, in terms of drug policy, when we're getting to a situation in the UK where if nothing is done about it by next April, they are just blatantly legislating states of consciousness. There's nothing in the legislation that anchors it to harm. You know, the state has really crossed a line in terms of the territory it, it should be involved in. It's sort of arbitrary that we will respect kind of certain people's frameworks and, and not other people's through respecting um, religious freedom. But I do think, you know, Respecting people's spiritual practices is significant, and it's, I think it's a good place to start. And, and also, we've proven, it's been, it's been proven around the world in various countries that it works. You know, that, as you say, it still is only those specific groups, you know, the Santo Daime or the UDV or whatever, um, the Native American church, who, who have those exemptions. But it's a start, you know, and then I think once you can then see from those groups that their psychedelic use isn't harmful. And in fact, you know, a lot of the studies they've done, for instance, in Brazil on long-term ayahuasca use show that people are up on, in terms of things like, you know, social integration, um, you know, cognitive ability, etc. So I think that, that once you start making these kind of dents into prohibition, and then also you have the data to back up that you can prove that these substances aren't causing harm, that they're beneficial in these um, sort of structured ritualistic settings, it's a start getting us towards where we more broadly want to go. So, so you're right, you know, my heart is with cognitive liberty. It's, it's not with just saying that what you do is okay, what you do isn't okay. Your drugs are good, your drugs are bad. It's, that's kind of the opposite of what I believe in. But I think we have to work with the system that we, that we have and, and sort of move forward slowly because realistically, prohibition isn't going to collapse all in one go. It's going to collapse step by step.